Disclosure and directness. That people are honest in what they're saying and that they're open. Subgroups. 
that we might break this up into subgroups if we have enough people so people can discuss more and so on. Dealing with initial resistance. When you're starting a new group, are there going to be some people that are going to have problems? Mm -hmm. Remember, my wife was starting a new group and uh, uh, she had this lady that came in here that was basically going to tell them how they're going to run their group. AA, a lot of people from AA expect it to be like AA. You know, they want you to say, you know, I am an alcoholic and I'll be an alcoholic and my name is Joe. You know, uh, we don't do that in our group. So sometimes you have to deal with that initial resistance. But try to put their fears to rest. Having members openly share their anxieties about the group is a good thing when you start. Because that gets everything out. Everyone realizes they all have some anxiety about rejection and other things like that. Getting acquainted in small groups. If you have a large group, you can break into those small groups and have them talk to each other to get to know somebody. Leaders and others with previous experience share openly. Say, well, you know, when I was in a group, I had these problems and these things happened and I had some concerns and we're going to make sure that doesn't happen in this group. You know, so you don't have it. You have particular concerns. What are the questions that a person has when they come into a group? What do you as a leader want to think about addressing? First one, who are these people? You know, what, uh, will I be in or out of this group? How many like to be there where everyone sort of has a click and they all know each other over here and you're just sitting there and no one's talking to you? See the problem that could be? If I join, how involved will I be? Is this saying that I'm going to just continue to be here all the time and this is what I'm really doing? Or is this someplace I'm just going to drop in a little bit and check out a little bit and sort of see how it goes? Do these people like me? Do I like them? If they don't like me, do I want to be here? If I don't like them, am I going to come back? How much do I want to risk? Am I going to be open? Am I really going to learn and get something out of this? Or am I going to sort of hide myself? And uh, I'll just listen and I'm not going to take any risks in that group. And of course, the amount of risk you take has a lot to do with how much you can get out of the group, right? Mm -hmm. Can I really trust these people? I can tell everybody in the church. What is this group really about? As a leader, they need to know. Okay, we're focused on codependency. We're focused on drug and alcohol. We're going to help you get delivered. We're going to, what is this group really all about? What is expected of me? You know, at least that you're going to attend and you will try and share and you'll do the best you can. That's what we'll say to people. Hey, if you want to, you can just come and listen for a while. And that's okay. Do I fit in here and belong here? Can I be myself and be part of this group? Those are the questions that people are answering. And if, as a good leader, once you get used to this a little more, you can... Try and answer those questions as you're leading into the group, as you have people come to the group. So what are the first phases of a group? Birth and infancy are what's called forming. Because we're forming a group. That's the first stage here. And that's the things we just talked about. Where we get the rules put together, we decide, we get an idea of what we think about the group, how the group's going to be, we get a flavor for the group, and an idea for what's going to go. We get a, a thing set up. And then a childhood in groups is what's called norming. Norming is, what is this group going to be like? When I walk in, what do I expect? What are the norms of this group? Is everyone standing at their desk and screaming yell? Well, it could be if that's the norm of the group. I don't recommend that norm for some reason. Or if you walk into the group, everybody's standing on their head. It's a yoga group. <laughs> well, that's a different norm. But if that's what you begin to expect, that's what you're gonna. Uh, <laughs> that's what you're gonna have there. What are some of the issues? Trust versus mistrust. See, if I trust, then I'm gonna open up. Then I'm gonna be me then I can be accepted. But what if I don't really trust this group? What are some things you can do? If I give only basic information and deal on a superficial level until established. That's what most people do. With I'll come, and as long as I come, I'll act and do right. I'll have my nice little facade on. I won't get real. 
I'll do these things and so on. But what's the person doing? They're just thinking. They're seeing if it's going to go. They're seeing how much acceptance they have. They might put little feelers out, won't they? Yeah. They might open up that much and see if they get clobbered or not. If they get clobbered, they're going to shut right up and maybe not come back. But they can open up, then maybe they can trust you a little bit more to open up more and more and more. Is there an undercurrent of, host undercurrent of hostility and suspicion? If there is, it's going to change the entire flavor of the group, isn't it? What if, as, as you're in the group, you got several people in there that are really on each other, are critical of each other? See, you as a leader, if you want this group to go, are going to have to deal with that. The deal is you've got to pull everyone in if we want this thing to actually work. People might refuse to focus on their self. They might be abstract or intellectual. You know, they give you all this theory, but they never get down to reality. They never get down to where they're really at. You know, don't want people coming and just sharing what they read in the last book. You know, what would you say as a group leader? Now, how does that apply to you? What did you get out of that? Very specific. Rely on the leaders to decide what needs to be dealt with. You really don't want that. You want them to come out and you want them to come with their ideas and to ask about things and, and to be really involved, don't you? You don't want the leader to just be lecturing at you all the time in the group. You might give information. Risk-taking at a low level. Because you basically just take a few risks here and here and here and here. Strategy. How do you develop security? in a group. First display your own commitment to the group. You know, even if you guys are not here, I'm going to be here. Even if no one shows up, I'll talk to myself. <laughs> but we will be here for you. And we would like to have you come. We'd like to have you committed to the group. We're going to be here for you. We'll do everything we possibly can. Take individual interest in group members. Would it be good if you knew their names? Would it be good if you knew something about them? And maybe after the group you stand around and you talk and you, and you try to get to know them a little bit. Would that help in forming your group and putting things together in your group? Deal positively with people's concerns. But if they bring up a concern and you say, oh, it's not going about that. Oh, come on now. Be real. Is that going to help? But instead, no matter what it is, because they, even if it's sort of off the wall, and you positively respond to it, what does that tell other people? They can even be off the wall some. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to put on a facade. They can be them. And even if they ask a dumb question, they're not going to get shot down. Respond properly to painful emotions. Okay, that's critical. Because if you don't, what's going to happen? They're not going to show their emotions. They're not going to allow themselves to be emotional in the group. Give honesty, spontaneity, genuineness, warmth to demonstrate that you're a safe person. If the group leader isn't safe, the group isn't safe. You can have a few unsafe people in a group if the group leader makes it safe by having good boundaries and control and not let them run, run amok. But if the group leader is not safe, you have a hard time having a group. So you see, that's beginning a group, okay? That's the initial stage of a group we just talked about. And you see the problems that you have. And you've got to work through that stuff. All groups that you're starting in are going to have those questions, and you're working through and you're setting up stuff. Okay, the next phase is called transition. Now, transition is, okay, we started out our initial stage, right? Now what we're doing is we're looking, we now need to transition, and we go through transition to end up at a working group. If you don't get through transition, you're not going to have a working group, and a lot isn't going to be accomplished in your group. Uh, this is the time when the critical mass or the core of the group, group formation of the core of the group is really important. What's the core of the group? People that are really committed. This is their group. That's coming because it's their group. They're getting something out of it. They want to be here. And they see it as their group. 
They're taking responsibility for the group to be here, to care about the other people in the group, and to do something. What we've learned here is if you don't have a critical mass or a, a core group of about five people that are committed, you're going to really struggle getting the group going. See, what happens if I come and uh, today there's only one other person besides the leader. Next time I come, there are five. Next time I come, there are two. Next time, no one shows up. What's going to happen to that group? Yeah, it's not going to ever get into the working stage. It's always going to be the initial stage. And especially if the number of people showing up all the time are different people. So it makes it very, very hard. So we recommend don't even start a group unless you have two leaders and five people that are reasonably committed to the group to really get the thing going. Because the tendency is going to be people have to work, other things come up, there are going to be things that are going to keep people from coming. And so you need to keep it. Just seems for some reason, uh, you get about the, the five, at least five people attending the group, you have time for a couple of people to mess or something, you're okay. But you get much less than that, uh, you're not okay. It just doesn't seem there's the interaction that you need for things to really work. The deal of the transition is we accomplish something together. Notice the we. We are here. We are working together. We have a team. We're trying to accomplish something together. Another way to look at it, this is teenage. The term that's used uh, in your one book is conforming. We got everything set up initially, now we're going to conform, we're going to fit in to this particular group. One of the things that's really interesting about this particular part that's called the transition is the power struggle. Because if you're going to have a power struggle, where is it going to be? Right here. Because the people are going to try to conform the group, try to make the group in a direction in which they are the ones that are in power, they're the ones doing all the talking, they're the ones that are trying to make it be the way they want. This is where negative feelings will be expressed. And they're going to find out what? Think of this as a testing phase. They're going to find out if you, the leader, I can handle negative feelings. They may demand the leader be more directive, or they may demand they take over leadership of the group. Or they may accuse the leaders of being too controlling and demand that the group be allowed to decide what's going on in the group. You get all sorts of dynamics going here, depending on the people. What do you need to say to yourself? Though? It's their problem, it's not mine. Unless you really have some problems, you don't know how to lead a group. The idea is these people come in with all their different issues and all their different problems. The question is, can you draw them into the group? Power struggles among, among the members may occur. Don't be overly defensive. Challenge the leader may mean the group is ready to get to work. At least they're doing something. That's better than them just sitting there and doing nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Even if they're challenging you, what's the worst thing you can do? Nothing. Shut up and sit down. I'm in charge. This is the way it is. If you want to come to this group, then you're going to do this and this and this. If not, see ya. What's that going to do to the rest of people in the group if you do that? But is there a time when you might have to do that? If the person's totally out of line, but usually you wait till after the group, you try to just get them calmed down. Or another thing you do is you get the group to take care of it. Say, what do you guys think about that? See, one very interesting piece of research is how much effect groups have on people. What they did is they did some little studies. And what they did is they told all these people they were, you know, they're part of an experiment and they don't tell them really what the experiment is. And what they do is they say, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to have you all vote on certain questions of whether they're true or false or whatever. And we're going to have, and we have the electronic display boards and the display board shows how everybody voted. And of course, what are, you, what are they actually doing? They're actually faking all the votes. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't know. You think the rest of the people are all pushing their buttons, and you think 
that's accurately displayed out there, but of course, what do they do? They take things where the person, uh, you know, it's a total lie. Everyone knows this is wrong. But it shows all the rest of the people who are voting yes. See, are you going to vote now? It shows how much influence that what other people do and what other people think and want have over you. If the whole group feels this way and you feel that way, the tendency is you're going to, well, maybe I better rethink this through. So groups have a tremendous amount of influences. As a leader, it's much better to use the other people in the group to take care of off-the-wall stuff. You have to watch that you don't make the person feel rejected by everybody else also. There's all the balance here in everything. This whole group leader thing is you have to figure, out, figure it out is a sort of balancing act. You're the facilitator. You're trying to get everybody to get along but also get work done and to keep things on a, a good level here. Uh, Self-disclosed feelings about the power struggle as a way of modeling group behavior. You can say, well, I know. What do you think about this? Yeah? You know, when they said that, this is the way I felt. Oh, when I was in this group before, this happened and this happened and this happened. In other words, you process it. You work the thing through. And if you can effectively work through these areas of what we call transition, you're going to end up in a working group. It's going to be able to function. Self-focus versus other focus. The initial tendency is to talk, to up, talk about others, isn't it? Why? Safer. Focus on people in situations outside of the group setting. That's one of the rules, isn't it? Now, the here and now, you deal with I and we. Storytelling is a facade of working instead of revealing feelings. You tell all these nice little stories, keeps everybody interested, they might laugh, but what are you really doing? It's a defense. You don't want to open up. You don't want to get there. And how would you handle that as a group leader again? Well, why do you think it is that people tell stories in groups? Yeah, and let people share. And you they won't have too, anywhere, too much storytelling in the future after that, will you? In the initial phase, it must get members to focus on themselves. Need to conform in such a way that they do not close off. Understand, you can have so much conforming that everyone is sitting shaking in their boots. <laughs> they're all so afraid they're going to get jumped in and shot like Joe just got shot. So you have those kind of problems in this uh, transitional stage. We're never getting to a working stage, are we? We just say you're shutting things down. You gotta understand there's a lot of dynamics going on when you're leading a group like this. The good news is after you do this for a while, it just becomes sort of natural. You sort of just flow with it. And of course the good thing is go to God and say, God, I can't do it, I'm trusting you to do it. You know, and you just sort of flow with it. Must reach a critical mass in the core group numbers. Cohesion. You gotta have at least those people that are gonna consistently be there. Desirable traits, trust and acceptance, empathy and caring, hope, commitment to change, intimacy, that's being known and no, to know and be known as you really are, self-disclosure, and conflict resolution. All, if you have all those things, that's all the good stuff we're trying to develop at this particular point. Dangers may become close to outsiders. What if you're so successful that they're so conforming and this is an open group that when new people come in, they got their little click over here and they don't accept new people coming in? Because we've been doing this for 10 years now, you know what I mean? Who are you? Can't become so comfortable to each other that the individual growth stops. This is a fine place to get patted on the back and everyone likes everyone else and we all love you and great and you come and you get your jollies and you go home. But no one's really opening up, no one's really doing anything. The members quit challenging one another. They lose the desire to change. The group's all I need. We just get yeah, codependent on the group, right? Uh, the group loses the focus or the reasons for existence. Instead of focusing on what it is, well, we're just sort of all over the place. We really don't know what we're doing here. We just kind of meet. Now, why do we meet? Let's see. I don't know. 
need the balance between encouragement and challenge and comfort and confrontation. Did you see the picture now, the transition phase? For the transition phase, then you go to the working phase. How do we know what a working phase is when we see it? And by the way, one of the reasons we're doing a group with you here is that we're going to see those things actually happen in experience as we uh, have these groups and we do the groups. Another term for this is performing or maturing. Different books use different terms. I'm just sort of giving you all of them as we go through these different things. Here. The group identity is shaped by choices. Disclosure versus anonymity. Self-disclosure is required to learn about yourself. If you don't open up in a group, how much are you going to get out of it? Very little. You might get the support. Fear of rejection stops. These are, if you're in a working group, that's what it's going to look like. When you come, you're not shaking your boots. You're not afraid of what you're going to say. You feel accepted enough that you can open up and you can talk about your real issues. Honesty versus gameplay. Believe that in order to get ahead in the world, you must suppress how you think and feel. No. Act how others would expect of you. Don't want that either. It's essential that the honesty prevail and not have uh, to be disclosed to get acceptance. It can't be driven the other way either, can it? In other words, it's really more like you can be you, so you act like you. Spontaneity versus control. You can't force yourself to be spontaneous. It allows members to respond naturally in the event that something happens. Acceptance versus rejection. Explore the fears of rejection directly. Sometimes afraid they won't know how to respond if they're accepted. All members must work together for acceptance of each other. Cohesion versus fragmentation. These are all the issues you've got, but in a good group, uh, it's essential that you have people pulling together. Based on choices to bond together for the common good comes only from working through meaningful, sometimes painful problems. See, what's really going to happen? It's all going to be based on what happens in the group and what really goes on and what issues are really dealt with. The harder the issues that are dealt with and worked through, the more confidence you have in the group and the more you're going to open up. So this is one of those like snowballs. You know, it starts small and as it is going good, it gets better and better. What if it's going worse? It can get worse and worse, but that's when the leader needs to intervene and make sure. That's why you're there as a leader, is to make sure that those kind of things don't happen. Responsibility versus blaming. In a working group, guess what? People take responsibility for what they say, what they do, what they have done in the past. They don't come in there and say, you know what, if you knew my wife, you would act like I do too. <laughs> In a working group, it's going to be, you know what? She has her problems, but I've got my problems, and I'm here to deal with me. What do you guys think? Leadership issues. Is it really working? Is it energizing the group? Resistance to working makes the leader want to quit instead of confront it openly. You can get to the place where the work is, group isn't going like you want it to go. Do you want to go as a leader? You want to have to confront people all the time or deal with stuff all the time? But in a working group, you don't have that. In a working group, you want to be there as much as the people that you're leading, and you're seeing God work through you, God work through the people of the groups, and you're seeing people make progress. And of course, that's what we're looking for. Express to the group what we see happening in the group. One of the jobs of the leader is saying, now, if you see how this particular thing happened, I'll give you sort of a funny story of a group, okay? Uh, I was in this particular group and I was counseling this lady that was in the group. And she was a good girl. That meant she had a facade on and she always was, I mean, sugary, syrupy <laughs> in everything that she said. Everything was agreeing with the leader. Everything was never, you know, she was just so surfy you could almost got stuck. You know what I mean? 
And in the middle of the group, and we were in a part of the church that sort of has outdoor uh, doors and everything else, uh, this spider was walking across the floor. And people knew this girl by then, you know, and so on. And she takes a piece of paper and she slides it down there for the spider to crawl on. Now, what do you think she's doing? Being a total good girl, right? Because a good girl wouldn't want to step on a spider, would she? She'd want to pick it up on the piece of paper and go outside and let it go, right? <coughs> but instead, she flicked the spider at another girl in the group. <laughs> now see, as a leader, how do you handle it? Well, isn't this wonderful? She's finally breaking out of her good girl mode. She finally feels safe enough that she can actually act out her emotions. Uh, however, we need to realize that we don't flick them at other spiders at other people in the group, that the other person probably wasn't too happy about this. But it, we are making progress, aren't we? See, by reframing that, of uh, you see what I'm saying? And the whole group just laughed and they looked at the cell. But it was a deal that this girl was making progress. I was saying, hey, look, that may be so weird, but we're, you know, we usually don't do that in groups and we need a new rule about flicking spiders. But, <laughs> 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 but the thing is, the group handled it well and saw it as an improvement that she was actually starting to get real. And starting to let her feelings out, even if they were negative ones. Termination. That's the last phase. Now, in our groups, uh, most of them don't terminate. They just keep going as more people come in and other people leave. But some groups, you have a certain set amount of weeks that you're going to be doing, and you terminate. Or what are the other reasons that groups might terminate? They're not going well. They're hurting people more than they're helping people. And those, of course, are very hard groups to terminate. But the idea of why do they end? And that this is called old age or reforming, some other terms for it. Uh, the stated length of time expires. The task is accomplished. The group explodes into conflict. A uh, group core or norms can't be established. Conscious decisions by the group to end. Group leadership is not met to the task. Group divides to form two new groups. That's a very usual one because you're raising up new leaders and you say, okay, we're, you know, we're having like 20 people here. And our rule is we think about splitting a group if we hit about 20. Because you can form two good groups of 10, still have the core. But sometimes groups don't want to do that. And then we'll break them up and have subgroups, you know, and so on. So they're just different things. You let the group sort of decide that. But especially if they're dealing with several topics, Sometimes it's easier to split them into two groups that can more focus on those particular topics. Poor administration or constant change depletes membership. People just aren't coming. Conflict with other church programs. Uh, members are not compatible. One of the things that we'll do with groups if we have those problems, though, we will either uh, maybe split the group and take this group because we think they can get along and this group because they can get along. Or we'll get other people that have experience in groups and actually stack the group if we have to. If they're getting too negative, we'll stack the group with a whole bunch of positive people, you know, and change the dynamic of the group to try and make the group function. I'm trying to show this group leadership thing isn't necessarily the simplest thing. It isn't you just go and start doing this. There's a lot of different issues and a lot of things that we have to deal with here. Another one is the leader is leaving. As I mentioned before, what we try and do is bring in another leader before that time and have them grow into the group, take over it slowly more and more and more. So it's a smooth transition rather than you walk in and the leader's gone. Probably lose a lot of your people if you do that, especially if they like that particular leader. One thing we used to do that we don't do anymore is that for a while, so people wouldn't get so attached to the leader, we were shifting leaders between groups. We decided that probably isn't th that effective and doesn't buy that much uh, if a, you have a good leader, they're not going to let people get codependent on and it's not going to be a problem. See what I'm saying? But if you, if you have a struggle with that, you can do that. But if you're shifting leaders, you want to do it smoothly, you want the people to know or you want it to be their choice, you don't just want to have them walk in one day and say, let me introduce you to your new leader. 
Because leaders have different styles too. Do you see that within this, you can have 15 different leaders and I'm going to do it 15 different ways just so they accomplish the tasks that we're talking about here. Uh, clarify the meaning to the group. The reason this is happening is because of this. It has nothing to do with you. It isn't because you're bad people and that's why the leader left or any of the other kind of things like that. Consolidate gains and feelings about the group. Now let's talk about what we have then. You came and now where are we? That's consolidation. Uh, decide how their life will be affected. Okay? What it comes down to is that this group is closing down, but we have three other groups that you can count. At particular different times. You know, the reason we're closing down this particular time is because the church has changed its format and they're going to have a service and we're in the room where the service is going to be. So we have to move it to some other place. Sorry about that, but what do you think we ought to do? You work with it. Ending groups sessions. Uh, leave some unanswered questions. And talk about, so we're talking about ending the entire group. Now we're just talking about a group session. You don't have to get everything pat and taken care of in any group, particular group session. You can say, hey, uh, I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to that. We'll pick that one up next time. And we'll keep working that through the thing. Commitment to invest energy into the group. You can leave. How many TV shows do they leave an opening at the end of how it's going to turn out? Guess what they do? Get a lot of people to come back, don't they? If you sort of, okay, we've dealt with this whole issue, it's totally done, why should they come next week? You might sort of wet their whistle a little bit. Now next week we're going to get into this and this and this. And that's a really critical thing. What have they learned? What have you gotten out of the group so far? Getting testimonies at the end. So they all walk away, hey, wow, this is good. This person got this help. This person got this help. This person got delivered. This person's been sober now for so many months. And they're succeeding so far. One thing that AA does that we haven't done here too much is you get these little medallions that they give to group members for how long they've been sober. There are different awards. At an ending and a termination, you can do the same thing. You can give out some plaques for the quietest person in the group, the rowdiest person in the group, the, or whatever, the one that made the most progress. You know, like sort of like the most valuable player. Just watch out that people aren't offended. You all do this in a positive type of thing. Premature termination. Those are the hardest ones. Explore the reasons for leaving the group setting when possible. Do whatever as smooth as you can. Answer any questions that you possibly can. Uh, deal with any misgivings. Be positive. Be honest. Express any fears, any hope. Try and process it before. So do you see now what we've talked about? We've talked about the main phases that you go through a group. You have the initial phase, remember? That through getting things set up, okay, then you have the where you're you have the intermediate phase or the transition phase where you're trying to move and get everything together, get people functioning together into the working phase. Then you have the working phase, that's where the work gets done, and that's where you want to have your group as long as you possibly can, because that's when things are happening. And then sometimes it's required to terminate and have a termination phase. And we'll see that as it happens in our group. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have the answers. And Lord, you had your group of disciples and you did all this thing, even with your group, Lord. And we ask that you would help us to learn and to grow and to be good leaders that could work a group and take a group through these different phases into a working place where they can learn and gain and grow. In Jesus' name. Well, today we're going to be looking at uh, section 6. And I hope that you looked at your syllabuses and figured out that we skipped uh, sections 4 and 5. And the reason for that is that we don't have enough sessions here to cover everything that's in the book. So we want to cover the most important sections. What did you guys get out of section 6? It's called God Speaks. It was uh, 
generated uh, a lot of a lot of thinking on, on my part as far as you know, times when I wasn't sure if if uh, God was hearing my prayer and what uh, uh, what might really be happening other than you know some of the things that uh, I thought or mostly was just confused and unsure about. Probably just all your sin, right? Yeah, probably. <laughs> 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 and the other part too. And the they did give that example. There are a lot of Christians out there, they haven't got past the phase of the legalism, and so therefore they see God as this sort of dispenser that you, you know, you got to perform it. If you perform, then maybe he does something and, uh, and so on. And, uh, and of course, Good thing about this section is it helps us get down to sort of the nitty gritty of reality. I got a question before we go on to that. Where do you think this group is right now in the stages of groups that we discussed today? Do we want to sort of apply things as we go along in uh, leading these groups? Where do you think we are? Well, I think uh, we're starting to get into the comfortable space. Okay, it's getting a little more comfortable. So what do you, which, what would be the term for the, uh, the uh, where we are? The norming. Okay, the norming, okay. So maybe the transition type of thing. That maybe we've sort of got our rules set up, although we came with, you said I'm saying, but we really haven't totally got into the working stuff. You know, I don't see you coming here, you know, just jumping in, and well, I've got my issue, you know, I've got these issues, and I had an issue with that, and I want to really deal with it, I'm going to really open up and say how I really felt, you know, we're willing to, you know, if we're willing to step out a little bit, but no one here is really getting down to the nitty gritty of <coughs> real life here. Mm How -hmm. many of you ever had a long term, term of silence from God? Okay. Mm -hmm. I thought, I thought that. And, and how, let's have you share something. How did you feel? What did you think? Well, at that point in time, I just felt a little bit cut off from God. Now, had I had the knowledge and insight that this book provides, and I would have realized, wow, well, God's actually trying to really get me to a new level. But I didn't think like that. I thought, I'm bad. I sin. I'm not worthy. God must not love me. Mm -hmm. Understood. That's how I felt. I feel like uh, I was doing something wrong. I'm doing something wrong. So, you know, what am I doing wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, because you can't, when you can't hear it, then, you know. It's, to me, it's like something, I'm not doing something right. I'm doing something wrong. What am I doing? What, what am I doing? What am I doing wrong with that? You know, I can't. Get an answer. I can't hear from you. So that's where I was. You know what am I doing wrong? Because so I just on this thing, I'm doing something wrong. You know. So. What's the deal? I had a period of time. Uh, I was really wanting close to the Lord, but something happened one day, and I don't know what it was. But all of a sudden, there was no longer any presence of the Lord. And it lasted for three months. And uh, I really was at a loss because I had been walking in a very deep relationship with God. Um, as I said, this would have really helped me to understand, but I thought, apparently God has cut me off and I'm lost forever. However, um, I'll keep trusting God just in case that's not what happened. <laughs> <laughs> but it was three months of literally not hearing the voice of God, not feeling the presence of God. Um, very empty, very dark, very lonely. And uh, But I learned through that to trust. And it was a good experience. We want to go through it again, but it it had a good outcome. Is there any situations in the Bible like this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, do you, what do you think? What, what's one of them? Talks about the story of Lazarus. Yeah? How about Hezekiah? 
Bible says God left Hezekiah for a period to test him to see what he would do. And of course, he didn't do well. He ended up telling the Babylonians about everything and setting up the whole Babylonian captivity during the time period. But he found out. What if you had somebody in your life that you knew and they just didn't talk to you for a while? What conclusions would you reach? What about you? Why are they mad at me? <laughs> most, people, most people did. Yeah, and I guess that would depend on exactly how well you knew them and, and, their, and, their, and their schedule because if they were off my task or something. Yeah, most of us tend to, tend to, well, they must have a problem. Especially ladies particularly because uh, communication means connection, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But see, the difference between God and with us is uh, really, see, with other people, there's another answer, isn't there? They got a problem, I'm going to pray for them. But can, <laughs> we, but can we do that with God? <laughs> no. Well, we can do it, but we're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try anyway. Remember a story Bob Humphrey one time was, uh, God, he was talking to God, and God said, Bob, you and I are incompatible. <laughs> and he says, ah. And then God said, and I don't change. So what are some of the reasons that God might not answer us? Silence. Not in his will. Okay, it could be, it could be out of his will. And sometimes we know that because... Mm -hmm. We could have just... We, I mean, our flesh. We could be, we could be in our flesh and not the spirit. Just... Timing. We may just need to be in the way. Well, especially if it comes to a, a prayer being answered, as, as he talked about in the book. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we wait a long time for an answer. But one of the previous lessons talked about, um, or it was something else I read, that it was talking about preparing us, getting us into a place where we can work in that particular situation. Even Paul, when he had 12, 10, 12 years before he went into ministry, and uh, no doubt he conversed with God and was close to God, but still there was that period of time he was probably ready to go right away, but he had to wait. So sometimes we don't really know why the answer doesn't come. My experience is that most of us, at least I did, I was thought I was a whole lot more advanced than I was. And later on, I found out that maybe had he given it to me at that particular point, that yeah. would not have been good. He might be answering you, but you're not really hearing it because you want it to be a different answer. Mm -hmm. And so you're just going on, going on this direction when he's trying to play you this direction. I mean, you try to tell God you got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> you should put that model A, did you? <laughs> Sometimes God just doesn't fit my plan. Yeah, he said that the dumb idea is smarter than we are. I don't know where he gets that from, but dude. Well, it is interesting that we we tend to think it's there's something wrong with us. all those situations. And, but yet God put a whole book in the Bible as as uh, a great big clue mm -hmm. that that you know may not be be uh, what the situation is. Yeah. Of course the book of Job. Yes. Uh, you know. And uh, we but we still tend to I think that thirty eight chapters he doesn't <laughs> hear from God, does he? <laughs> what was, what was the issue there though? His faith was shaken. See, and I think we have to realize that sometimes we don't hear our ability to hear from God is based on our faith and where we are. And when things go bad, see, that leads into the whole circumstance question. How many of you ever had things happen, circumstances in your life that maybe you didn't think were good? 
some point. See, I've been sort of asking questions and you've been sort of answering them. So to move us through the transition phase, what am I going to have to do? Shut up. Right? And let you guys uh, respond to each other or come up with uh, what did you get, you know, what, what things did you see, what are the critical issues here uh, that uh, were in the book that you want to know about or you want to see how other people thought about it or, or whatever. And also say, I need to get you to start, and all of us to start being more personal about our own lives rather than generalities. Well, I heard about this. Do you see that? Do you see how much we're in the transition phase that we're not really uh, getting out there? We're not really working at a deep level. People are still just putting little, toss out a little bit here. I'll say my little thing to, to be in the group, but I'm not really uh, uh, dealing with me. And, 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 and what are my issues? Have you ever had anything in your life that was absolutely devastating? I mean, it just blew you away by the pain and everything else. And later <clears> on, <throat> you can look back and see it was for your good. So then we call this good-looking evil. Boys, it was really good. God did it and God knew what he was doing. But from our myopic point of view, I evaluate it right now and I say, God, what are you doing? <laughs> I like what it says here in day one. It says sometimes God is silent as he prepares to bring you into a deeper understanding of himself. Whenever his silence comes, continue doing the last thing that I told you and watch and wait for a fresh encounter with him. Maybe we're in God Chasers. Mm -hmm. One of the things it says, actually, one of the books he read later, uh, after that, he talks about the uh, uh, dad playing hide and seek with his kid. I would a dad, when the kid wants to love him, love, love on him, hide. And of course, he talks about he'll hide behind the door or something, but he'll leave one toe sticking out or something. See, what's the purpose of hiding? Why does God hide from us? So we can see. Yeah. yeah, because if we don't, if we're so easy, but yeah, the more that it's actually a game, but the game is uh, so they can show how much they want to be with that. Mm -hmm. If God just was always here and everything and so on, we wouldn't be pursuing Him. The Bible says that if we seek Him with all of our heart, <clears throat> then He'll be found. What do you do when you try to get in contact with God? You usually uh, get into the Word, whatever, you know, try to, try to locate uh, in the Word those areas that, uh, you know, I feel like are, are relative to the, 
situation, whatever, whatever's going on, or uh, uh, be reading and meditating uh, uh, on, uh, uh, you know, in an attempt to gain, you know, more spiritual insight into to various concepts and, and things that, I, that he wants to teach us through his word. Uh, and uh, usually that's, that's kind of a springboard, you know, to, to uh, you know, to getting some additional wisdom or, or knowledge about, about uh, God and how he works with, with him. And then that's usually when he takes that and kind of confirms it in my heart and really drives it home. Uh, so studying meditation is what you're saying? Yeah. You're taking a class. Okay. In a class, you get challenged. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you guys only knew how much of a long parents, it's still amazing. But you just challenge me. For me, I usually have to get to an end of myself. Mm -hmm. I, get, I do the same thing. I'll get in and I'll study and study and study and study. But then I have to get very frustrated. <laughs> and then I have to give her, God, you got to do something here. Um, the boat's about ready to sink. You know, I got no clue what the answer is there. I can't get this thing put together, God. God, you got to show up. And when I get really honest with him, it's like reading the, uh, the book God Chasers and so when I read books that just convict the living daylights out of me. <laughs> and I get honest with God. I can't believe how how old I am. I can't believe I'm just going through the motion. I'm not doing this. Then all of a sudden he shows up and I hear and so but I have to get really honest and get all the facades down and realize that I can't do it and do all of that and you know I've got to keep doing that again and again, but he says that's what works for me. That's what I fast and pray until I know where I'm supposed to be reading the word, and if I have to fast for a day or a week or four weeks or eight weeks or whatever it takes, it's just I'm getting just going against my flesh so that I can hear from God, and it's it's helped. It definitely helps. So you can't. That's a, that's a good thing to do. And it also talked in the book about uh, markers. <coughs> What do you think about that? It was relating that if you are lost and you're not hearing from God, like what the uh, Rabbi had just read there, about, you know, do the last thing you told me. But the other thing is, if you get confused, go back and see what the markers were. I used to really be in the mountain climbing and the hiking and all that kind of stuff. How do you think we found the trails? Carrots, those little stacks of rocks that people put. Of course, the rocks are missing. Now you're, now you're looking all over the place. Now where in the heck is this trail at? Especially if you're just going across the field of rocks and you can't find it. You're looking, where's the next stack? But that says something to me, because that way if, if you get lost, you can always go back to the last carrot you found. And you can, okay, the trail's got to go here some way. Uh, and so on. You can look at the things that God has done in our life and say, okay, hey, I'm at the right place. I just don't know where to go. I'm not off trail. I'm on trail. I go back to the last one. And I also see the other one so I know that I'm where I'm supposed to be. Can I get more specific? I think we're still superficial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is there in you that got a hold of you that's important to you that you want to know or you want to understand or you want to see if we all have the same experience let's get real what is well, this whole hearing from God thing about what is it is critical to you Christian. 
picture of them. And I remember I spent like five hours uh, one Saturday just praying, you know, and, and uh, he finally just, you know, uh, dropped it in my heart and said, you know, don't. You know, he said basically it was, you know, don't be looking at other people. Don't let other people sin cause you sin. So it was a completely, you know, stop looking at other people and their effect on me and, and, and uh, decided that uh, I had to take responsibility for myself and, and work strictly on, on getting the sin out of my own life. And uh, that's what he was, you know, that's what he was trying to, trying to tell me. Help me a lot. That's one of my, that's one of my boundaries. I can go back to that and I can say, this is where the Lord spoke to me and I, I got my eyes too much on other people and circumstances of things when, when I just need to concentrate on, on what He's doing. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above Him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer. For the world today Above him there's no other